right, so we will go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. My name is Hamara Osman, and on behalf of Muscular Dystrophy Canada, MDC, I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar from our new Let's Talk NMD, Let's Talk Neuromuscular Disorder series. Before I introduce today's topic, I would like to mention that we have muted all participants, but I do welcome you to type any questions or comments throughout today's session in the chat box. We have a lot of time at the end of today's session for a live Q&A. Please note a recording of today's webinar will be made available by the end of the week on our MDC YouTube channel. With that said, let's get started. Today's weekly webinar is on spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. This is a very timely webinar as August is SMA Awareness Month here in Canada which is dedicated to increasing awareness for SMA, supporting those living with SMA, and creating connections for the SMA community. Although Muscular Dystrophy Canada represents over 160 different neuromuscular disorders, we recognize the unique needs and rich lived experiences of li individuals living with SMA and their family members. We aim to develop education materials, information, and networking opportunities for the SMA community in Canada, and to provide support for clinical and translational research for SMA. We are very grateful for our terrific lineup of speakers that can help to share trusted and evidence-based information um, on SMA. In advance of their presentations, I would like to thank each of our speakers for their time and expertise. First, we have Dr. Mark Olivier de Guise. Dr. DeGeese is currently a pediatric resident physician at Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and he's been involved with the SMA community through a research lens for the past eight years. He obtained his MD, PhD combined degree at the University of Ottawa under the supervision of Dr. Rashmi Kathari. During his PhD in Dr. Kathari's lab, he significantly developed the idea of SMA as a systematic disease rather than merely a motor neuron disease. He either led or contributed to the identification of muscle defects, defects during development, defects in muscle atrophy pathways, immune system dysfunction, normal development, defective amino acid and fatty acid metabolism and SMA, as well as the development of new type like mod mild model of SMA mice. Some of his current work focuses on satellite cell impairments, metabolic defects in SMA, and translation of basic SMA research in the patient population. The breadth of his work has been recognized by the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame Award for Medical Students in 2018, the Award of Excellence in Graduate Studies from University of Ottawa in 2017, and the Dr. Ronald G. Wharton Researcher and Training Award of uh, the Ottawa Hospital in 2017. Welcome, Dr. DeGuise. Um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing so you can share your slides. Can everyone see my screen uh, right now? Yes, we do. Yes. If you just put it in presenter mode, we'll be able to see it um, largely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, in this webinar series. Um, as for the introduction, I've been mostly involved in SMA for the past um, eight years now through a research lens. And uh, it's been really great to see all the advancement that has happened uh, over the time that I was involved uh, with the SMA community. So just before we start, I have some conflict of interest that are outside of the scope of this presentation. So today during the webinar, we'll be uh, trying to help answer some of the questions surrounding uh, what is SMA, what are the different types of SMA, uh, what are the signs and symptoms, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Osquit touching on the current treatment options as well as, as some of the clinical trials. Uh, I'll be covering the first few, uh, the first two topics. So, when we talk about spinal muscular atrophies, uh, it's important to know that there are two big classes. Uh, the first one that uh, most listeners will probably know about is the 5Q SMA, and this is uh, truly the most common uh, one that we know about. And uh, it is related to the SMN1 gene that is uh, located on the 5Q chromosome, and that's why we call it 5Q SMA. There are also non-5Q spinal muscular atrophies, 
which are other diagnoses within the SMA umbrella. And those are generally more rare. They have specifier uh, that uh, do explain a little bit more of the phenotype. And what's really important to know for families who are diagnosed with non-5Q SMA is that this is not the same genetic basis that you have um, in a 5Q SMA, and the current treatments that are available right now are indicated for 5Q SMA. So when I was asked to um, discuss the SMA types, um, I did scratch my head a little bit because, as you know, um, many of the, all the SMA types as we know them are identified mostly clinically and not necessarily based on the genetic makeup of the individual. And now with newborn screening and new treatment that have been coming on uh, in the past few years, the SMA phenotype will uh, change and constantly evolve over the years. And really it is likely that this nomenclature will fall out of favor at some point uh, because it mostly relies on the highest molar, uh, uh, molar milestone that have been achieved as well as uh, when did the uh, first uh, symptoms arise. And so when we talk about the uh, SMA type, uh, there is really five types that have, been, um, that have been segregated. One of them being, uh, if we go through them, SMA type zero, which is mostly a prenatal onset of symptoms. Uh, most of these patients will never sit and have much of a reduced lifespan um, without any support. Uh, in a similar fashion, SMA type 1 uh, patients are generally diagnosed between the age of 0 and 6 months, never sit unsupported uh, without supportive therapy or, or new treatments, and their lifespan is uh, considerably reduced to less than 2 years uh, without any uh, management. And similarly, if we look at uh, SMA type 2, as you see, we go through a progression. Uh, these patients are generally uh, diagnosed between 6 and 18 months, will uh, gain the ability to sit, uh, but may never walk independently. And uh, many of them have a lifespan well, well over 25 years. Um, when we talk about SMA type 3, we uh, are mostly diagnosing the, the individuals between the age of 18 months and 18 years. Many will uh, be able to stand and walk, but may lose this ability later in life, and their lifespan is almost normal. When we talk about SMA type 4, a uh, much rarer uh, type of SMA, um, these individuals are generally uh, diagnosed in their adulthood. They will be uh, mostly having a normal um, lifespan, able to stand and walk um, for most of their life, but they may need uh, walking aid assistance uh, earlier on. Uh, one of the things that I should point out is that SMA type 1 is the most uh, the highest incidence with about 60% of individuals with SMA will be diagnosed with SMA type 1. Um, when we talk about the, the patients that we see most often, uh, we talk mostly about SMA type 2 and SMA type 3, mainly because uh, these individuals tend to, to have a longer lifespan. And so uh, the genetic behind uh, 5Q SMA um, is fairly simple uh, at first. And basically, this is a disease where both mom and dad have one defective allele of SMN1. Uh, both parents are asymptomatic. Um, parents with a defective allele of SMN1 are in proportion of one in 40 individuals. And um, when both mom and dad give the defective allele to the baby, that's when uh, we see uh, the SMA condition arise. Uh, and so mom and dad have one in four chance uh, of having a baby that has SMA. Um, and SMA will arise depending on the studies we talked about, uh, one in 6,000 or one in 11,000 lives birth. However, there is a little bit more to the story, and that being uh, the SMN2 gene. And so the SMN2 gene is a very, very uh, closely related copy of the SMN1. Um, very few differences between the two genes. One difference is um, 
uh, one nucleotide change uh, somewhere in the sequence where uh, in, instead of having 100% uh, of protein production, you instead have somewhere around 10% of that production. In unaffected individuals, uh, that will lead you to what we say a little bit more than 100% of SMN protein. In SMA, however, as we discussed, we completely lose the SMN1 gene. And so 100% of that production that was coming from the SMN1 gene is abolished. And what we're left with is uh, the 10% that comes from the SMN2 gene. And what's very interesting about all this is that the production level of the SMN protein will be proportional with the severity uh, of the disease. And so if we looked at this graph here, you can see that uh, individuals that have more copies of SMN2, so if we look at four, generally have a much milder phenotype. And, um, and it really it depends on how many copies uh, are um, given from mom and dad. And so if we look at SMA type one patients, generally they have two copies of SMN2. When we looked at SMA type 2 patients, they generally have three copies of SMN2. Type 4, it's a fairly evenly split between three and four copies. And when we talk about type 4 patients, they generally have four and plus copies. However, we know that this is not necessarily the... Sorry about that. We know that this is not necessarily the only, uh, the only factors that determine the severity. Uh, there are often discrepancy between siblings. Most of these factors we don't really know well. Some of them that we have identified as genetic modifiers, some others as uh, some changes in the SMN2 gene and the SMN1 gene, uh, but, but most of the work still needs to be uh, done on that front to determine what are the other factors that can influence the phenotype. And so, what does that SMN protein do in the body? First, uh, one of the important thing to note is that it is present in every organs of the body and every cell. If we don't have any SMN protein at all, uh, generally this is not compatible with life. As such, uh, the SMN2 is really what's allowing uh, viability and the more you have, the less severe generally the phenotype is. And this is just not to go through uh, that, but over the years uh, we have identified that SMN is uh, involved in, in a whole array of different um, functions, many of which are actually housekeeping functions of the cell that are necessary just to keep uh, the cell going. And some of the classical target of, the, of SMN depletion really has been surrounding the motor unit. And the motor unit is composed of um, the motor neurons that allow for, uh, for voluntary movements of the muscle and all our limbs. The neuromuscular junction that is the space just between the muscle and the motor neurons, as well as the skeletal muscle. And in SMA, we know that there is a loss of motor neurons and eventually the muscle does atrophy as a consequence of the motor neuron loss. There has been also uh, discussion as to whether or not muscle in and out of itself has their own um, intrinsic issues. And more recently, the neuromuscular junction has been well implicated in uh, the aberrancies in, um, in the electrical activity going from one end to the next. And the question is, you know, why is it only the motor neurons that are affected or the muscle or the motor unit as a whole? And really over the years, uh, there has been additional evidence that especially in preclinical models in the mouse, uh, that there are other organs that are implicated in some fashion in SMA. Um, there has been a lot less translation uh, towards uh, what can be seen in the SMA population. However, um, this is uh, certainly an active area of research at, at the moment. And um, 
and we may uh, have additional information uh, about this in the next few days. So adding to the complexity, we talked about SMN function, what it does in the body, um, how it can it modulate phenotype, but uh, one of the main question, and especially around treatment, is when is SMN needed? Um, we know that SMN is uh, needed early in development, and mostly uh, some of this data came from uh, animal models. So the earlier that SMN is removed, the more likely an SMA type will arise. And so uh, if you look here, uh, treated uh, SMA when we remove the SMN at, at P4 and P9, we see that we have much a reduced lifespan, but as we reduce it uh, later on, such as uh, 15 days of life in the mice, you see that we pretty much get uh, similar to a normal lifespan and anything after 21 days is essentially the same. When we reintroduce SMN in a mouse model that is sick, then the earlier we do this, the better are the outcomes. And so if you see here in the black line, this is four days after birth, we get a survival of nearly over 250 days for almost 50% of, of the, the mice. And alternatively, if we do it much later, such as 10 days after birth, uh, we do not get any survival benefits. So this is all in preclinical data in mouse models. Early clinical trials have also shown something very similar. So earlier treatment has yielded better outcome, and there was a nice review about this. But just to give you an example here of one of the, the clinical trial results, um, if we look, at, for example, at this individual who was dosed a little bit later, around eight months or nine months, you see that it's mostly uh, not necessarily increasing in the CHOP intense score, while a lot of the, the other individuals that had um, been dosed earlier uh, were able to achieve, um, achieve uh, increasing in their score on the CHOP intent. And interestingly, a very, very nice study just came out um, showing the SMN expression over the lifespan of individuals. Uh, this was mostly taken in different individuals, but it gives us an idea of when is SMN uh, elevated. And so here you can see on this axis is the amount of protein uh, that is in uh, the different tissues. And you see that very early on during pregnancy, SMN is really, really high. And so we look at the second tri trimester, the third trimester, and it remains high, albeit to lower level uh, within three months. And then as we go into adulthood, we get more of a quiescent level. This is better pictured here on the right. Uh, and as you can see, a very high level initially, and then we go down to, um, to a more basal level in adulthood. And so this was a, a very nice proof of concept of what had initially been uh, identified that SMN is really important in development. And, um, and uh, more recently even, there was a study in preclinical models showing that there might be prenatal manifestations uh, of SMA uh, even before birth. But a lot of this is very, very early and new. And so um, I think a lot more research will need to be done on that front. So when we talk about, so we talked about when is it important to have SMN and, and I guess the next question comes is how much SMN do we truly need? What are the levels that we need to achieve to get good, um, to get good uh, rescue? Uh, and there's really sparse data on these topics. Uh, how much, if we start with that question, we know that heterozygous carriers, so for parents, um, are generally uh, described as asymptomatic, as and these individuals will have 60% of SMN. Um, so they'll have one SMN1 producing and uh, SMN2 copies that will also be producing some uh, SMN protein. In mice, recently we produced uh, a very, very mild mouse model of SMA that 
uh, has a type four like phenotype. Uh, and these mice show about 35 to 40% of control uh, animals, um, 30, 35 to 40% SMN levels of control animals. And they do have a very delayed onset of phenotype. Um, so we know that at this point with what we have, or at least what we know is that we'll probably need a little bit more than 40% to uh, actually achieve um, achieve good outcomes, at least uh, in a uh, preclinical model. This still needs to be shown in, uh, in um, an SMA population. And how long? So do we, will we require treatment for uh, a lifetime or are we gonna be good uh, just initially by, um, by, finish, by doing a few treatments during development? Uh, this is again, very sparse data on this. We have very low, um, very low level of evidence whether or not SMN is required for cellular maintenance. Uh, given a, um, a lot of its function, it is likely that it will be at, at some um, way uh, be needed for cellular maintenance, but we don't have a lot of data at the moment. Uh, on the bright side, we do know that SMN levels is low in adulthood, and so um, the levels that we might need to reach during adulthood might be lesser. But for now, we don't have any strong uh, evidence of how long we'll need to uh, keep the treatment going. And when is SMN uh, removed during adulthood is, um, is not necessarily leading to SMA, though there are other deficiencies that are seen. Um, and so that's again, in preclinical models, so difficult to translate into um, an SMA population, but this is something that we need to keep in mind. So this is all I have for my section. Um, I think we'll uh, go ahead with Dr. Oskui at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Jukis. Um, yes, next we have Dr. Miriam Oskui. Dr. Miriam Oskui is a pediatric neurologist and epidemiologist. She's an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Neurology and Neurosurgery, and she's an associate member of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McGill University. She is a recipient of a Clinical Research Scholar Junior Two Award from the FRQS. Dr. Oskui serves as an evidence-based methodologist for the American Academy of Neurology and as a member of our Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee. She chairs the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry's SMA Working Group, and she's an investigator in clinical trials in SMA. Dr. Oskui is an established international leader in pediatric neuromotor disorders like uh, SMA and cerebral palsy. She's a recognized, passionate advocate for her uh, patients, and I'm very pleased to share, as I was looking up Dr. Oskui, that she was recently appointed as the Division Director of the Pediatric Neurology Department at McGill for a five-year term. Welcome, Dr. Oskui. Um, I believe Dr. DeGuise is going to stop sharing, so then you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, can everyone see my screen now? Looks great, thank you. Thank you for this um, introduction. And uh, thank you, Dr. De Guise, for always doing such a great job at very eloquently and clearly describing basic science um, to us. I've always been a fan. Um, and this is a list of my disclosures, some uh, um, relationship basically to most of the companies that would be mentioned, um, as well as my research um, funding. So as um, Dr. De Guise mentioned, um, the goals of this second part of the webinar um, is a broad overview of treatment options um, and current treatments and research um, in development, essentially a clinical trials um, update. But before talking about the different drugs available, I thought it would be a, an important um, way to start is to conceptualize how drugs come to market in Canada. Um, and it starts with a clinical trial, right? Um, and we've had um, a lot of families across Canada who contributed 
to um, this first part um, that's really essential in bringing darts to market, which is um, participating um, in clinical trials, not just for the potential benefit to yourself or your child, but also to help the scientific community um, answer important questions. And most of these clinical trials, their design essentially is trying to help us answer the question of, you know, what is the effect of this treatment on the individual outcome? And as you can imagine, there can be so many um, factors that have to be considered um, and adjusted for when trying to draw um, important conclusions from these studies. So the concept of external validity essentially is, you know, when you do a study, um, specifically in a, you know, you're not taking the, your entire population of affected um, uh, individuals, um, you're drawing from a specific group, right? So the, looking at the inclusion and exclusion criteria of that study, looking at the baseline characteristics within that study to see, well, even within those criteria, who did they actually um, study? Um, so that you can better draw conclusions as to, well, how does this now relate to me, right? Um, so there's myself, there's those around me who I've met with SMA, there's really everybody in the world with SMA, and what applies to one does not necessarily apply to, to all, right? Um, so being able to um, use some of this information to extrapolate or think about, well, in this study, we're looking at what's the effect of this treatment on outcome on those 10, 50, 100 individuals who participated in that study, right? So depending on the design, if they had a placebo or sham procedure group um, and a lot of other factors, we can kind of determine, well, um, the results reflect really the truth within that study. So if everything was the same and we used exactly the same type of people, um, this is what we would expect as an outcome. But then that doesn't tell us too much, it informs us, but then in practice or day to day, what we have to try to figure out is, well, what does this reflect in terms of the truth in, in, in real life, right? So for me, for everyone else um, who don't necessarily fit the criteria for this study, um, what conclusions can I draw? What can I expect? So once the study is done, if it meets its primary endpoint and it's found to be effective, um, then a lot of times what happens is there is an open label extension for the study so that the individuals who had enrolled in the study can continue to benefit from the drug. If there was a, um, a blinded a sham procedure or a placebo group, at that time they then transition on to getting the active drug um, if it was found to be safe and effective. Um, and the company will then apply for regulatory approval. But before Health Canada approves the drug, we want to make sure that um, those who have a serious illness, who really don't have other treatment options, can still on an individual basis get access to the drug. Um, so that's what the special access program is meant to address. Um, and it's really, um, a, it's an application that a physician can um, initiate on a um, individual basis. Um, but the criteria are um, actually quite clear um, that when uh, we, the, the, there's a seriousness of the disease, which um, for most spinal muscular atrophy would fulfill. Some of the special access programs um, in the past have focused more on um, infants with more severe disease um, because of this um, criteria. Um, and there needs to be some elaboration of, well, there's no other treatments available. Um, so this was the case when Nusi Nursen had reached its primary outcome um, and the SAP program had been opened. Um, at that time, there really were no other treatments available. Um, so everyone fulfilled this criteria. Um, today, it's more um, in, on an individual basis because we already have treatments available um, for individuals with SMA, although not for all. Um, and some who meet criteria may have tried it and um, it uh, didn't agree with them, they've had side effects, or there's some other reason for which um, their physician and themselves um, feel that there is an unmet need for which they want to apply for the special access program. 
Um, then when Health Canada has completed their review, um, they um, give out a notice of compliance um, to the company, essentially authorizing them to sell the drug in Canada. Um, one of the um, complaints, and <laughs> I'm going to phrase it as a complaint, that I have um, with every industry partner um, is that filing with FDA um, is done first, followed by the EMA in Europe, and then they will file with Health Canada. So a lot of times drugs are approved in the United States um, far in advance of Canada, and it is no fault of Health Canada. In fact, currently um, Health Canada has two drugs um, under review. Both of them have only recently applied and they were both granted by Health Canada a priority review and they're going to give a quite quick turnaround on them. Um, but the, the perceived delay uh, by the community uh, from the Canadian system, a big part of it goes to um, you know, holding industry responsible to come to Canada and apply to Health Canada in a timely fashion um, and not necessarily go to the FDA first or at least do it at the same time. Glad I got that off my chest. <laughs> and so when the NOC is available, then um, the drug is actually available for sale. Um, in parallel, um, there is a process in place that I'll mention um, in a bit for how it actually becomes uh, publicly funded. Uh, but even in advance of that, um, there can be private insurance or out of pocket or GoFundMes that then um, bring this drug to some individuals. The health technology assessment part is the common drug review process um, by CADF that essentially um, it's um, federal and Ines uh, from Quebec has its own process, but really they work together um, and they, they do it in, in, you know, they do their own process, but they uh, use the same kind of um, expert panels and information and they work together. Um, a lot of times they will not wait for the Health Canada approval. They'll start it way in advance and in parallel too. Um, so um, again, um, doing everything possible once the application's in place um, to go from regulatory approval, health technology assessment to uh, making it available to patients in Canada. Um, but this health technology assessment part looks at um, efficacy, but also um, looking at um, individual uh, benefits. Um, so if we're using um, uh, effect measures or functional motor assessments. Well, what does this mean for the individual? So there are very thoughtful uh, formal mechanisms um, at this point to bring in um, inputs from patient groups, uh, clinicians, um, and to really better understand how this um, impacts the day-to-day -day, um, of the individual. And then for reimbursement, we do have the Pan-Canadian uh, Pharmaceutical Alliance um, that does negotiate um, for all provinces. Um, there is no formal mechanism for patient input there. Um, but then the decision to um, list um, is provincial um, at that point. This whole process, this is what's in place right now. Um, it is evolving and um, there are reforms in play that are being pushed back and national strategies to, um, uh, hopefully no one is seeing, I'm on service, apologies, I'm getting text messages from the team. Um, and national strategies essentially to um, try to address the cost of high, um, high cost drugs without compromising access to Canadians. Um, and negotiating essentially for all of Canada. Um, but this goes, falls, I think, beyond the scope of um, today's webinar. But just so that you have um, some idea of how drugs um, from you know, beginning to end um, and what the different um, pressure points are um, in the system and, and where you can have an impact. Um, so for treatment targets, essentially, um, Dr. De Guise did a really great job at um, talking about the essentially the, the root cause, right, which is the SMN or survival motor neuron protein um, that is deficient in spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and um, not to go over um, his full presentation, but um, a few things are clear. Lots of research still needed, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and grateful to minds like Dr. De Guise who will continue on um, with a research career in this, but um, we know that 
SMN protein is essential for survival. We know that it is in the prenatal period, so before birth, that um, uh, we need this the most. We know that in the early um, infancy stage, so in the first few months of life, when um, after you're born, that's when you also need it the most. And that after that, for the rest of your life, you still need SMN protein, but it's kind of a low steady state. Um, and so when, um, uh, and then in addition to this, thinking about, um, you know, he had mentioned the SMA types that are um, from a clinical classification. Um, it is outdated, uh, but mostly I would say because um, we're not talking about four or five bubbles of individuals um, with a clear kind of separation between a one and a two and a three, right? Um, each individual with SMA is unique. It's a spectrum disease, um, meaning that the difference between um, one person to the next um, uh, is actually quite gradual. And so, um, you know, if you take two individuals who are both two months old and have the same SMN2 copy number, they will be different. They will react differently. They'll respond differently to treatments. Um, and so if you want to be effective at um, correcting the SMN uh, root cause, um, it would be to restore SMN protein before birth. Um, there are supplemental targets that we will call um, kind of um, non-SMN um, targets that by themselves will not rescue or will not be effective, um, but they offer um, great potential in combination treatments. So once the SMN protein is effectively restored, um, then combining with some of these treatments could potentially, um, if found effective, um, have an impact on other um, things such as endurance and fatigability. Um, so in um, uh, the next few minutes, uh, I will focus only on um, three treatments um, that are either available, so treatments that are available, or are currently available through the special access program um, and for whom the Health Canada approval has been requested and is underway. Um, there are um, SMN independent um, studies, um, Scholar Rock currently underway, um, but um, none with Canadian sites as far as I know. And I'll mention um, future trials um, afterwards. So starting with Nusi Nursin, um, or Spinraza that most of you should be familiar with. Um, this is a um, product from Biogen uh, that really um, had a tremendous impact um, to the SMA community. Um, this drug was approved by Health Canada um, in June 2017. And um, so that was the regulatory approval and then the health technology assessment where Ines and Cata evaluate the efficacy and the cost effectiveness and they make the recommendations um, to the ministers for reimbursement. Well, those recommendations followed one after the other, one in December um, and one a few months after uh, for the rest of Canada. Um, but then in terms of public reimbursement, um, the timeline was quite different from province to province um, with Quebec. Um, um, being the first to lead the way here um, and other provinces following with different reimbursement criteria that's actually created some um, inequities in care across Canada. The highest level of evidence behind Nusi Nursin is from two um, clinical trials that um, had a control arm. And this means that um, when children enrolled in the study, um, they were randomized to either get the drug or to get a sham procedure to which everyone was blinded. So there was no way to determine during the study who was getting the drug and who was not. Um, and both of these studies were stopped early um, because of the effect size, making it um, unethical to continue the study. So there was Endear that was in infants who were symptomatic um, and Cherish um, in um, older kids. Then they enrolled kids who were um, strong enough, 
not too much scoliosis or contractures that would limit improvement on the functional scales up to the age of 12, but I think the age of nine was the oldest uh, child enrolled in that study. Um, since then, um, a lot of other studies um, have been underway. Um, so the open label extensions into SHINE. So now we have long-term outcome on these um, uh, kids who are in these trials. Um, and we have observational studies in adults and, um, and uh, adolescents um, and across a wider spectrum um, showing that it is um, beneficial. It's a um, um, intrathecal, so it's through a lumbar puncture that the drug is delivered. Um, and the first year, um, there are seven treatments given, and after that, it's um, three treatments per year. Um, and the difference is because there is a loading period that's needed to reach um, adequate um, levels of the drug. Um, and um, that loading period um, is uh, maybe a sensitive period for um, younger kids who are um, losing motor neurons a little bit more rapidly. Uh, and there are future studies that are being um, proposed for new senior sins. Stay tuned. Um, there's a devote um, that will be looking at higher doses essentially to address this um, uh, point that I just mentioned, um, and also just to see if higher doses would be um, um, beneficial and safe. Um, and um, uh, another study looking at um, children who have um, received um, gene therapy um, to see if there's additional safety or um, efficacy. Um, so this is just the um, overview of their uh, clinical development program, showing you the studies both in infants, um, children, um, and the fewer ones than in young adults and adolescents. Um, and um, the uh, study that um, has only recently been announced um, to um, look at nusinersin in those who previously received um, gene therapy. Um, fingers crossed that there will be Canadian sites for this. So for gene therapy, um, this was developed by Vexus that was then brought out by Novartis. It was approved already by FDA uh, last year uh, and by EMA in Europe. Um, the approval is, or the label, because it's an intravenous um, delivery um, and there is um, essentially the intravenous delivery limits um, the dose, the safe dose available because it's based by weight um, and there's a significant hepatotoxicity for which um, steroid treatment is given to um, protect. Um, so the label that's applied for Health Canada is for um, children who have spinal muscular atrophy um, under the age of two. It also has been granted a priority review by Health Canada uh, with a parallel review of health technology assessment. Um, again, um, the regulatory process in Canada doing its best um, to expedite, um, however, um, application to Health Canada for this drug came much later than their application to FDA or EMA. The um, studies available for Zolgensma, um, there is one completed observational dose finding study. And so um, this was a study that um, recruited 15 children um, who were, um, uh, the first three was on a lower dose um, and then the next 12 um, on a higher dose, that's the uh, marketed dose. And now the pivotal studies, the phase three studies, all also observational um, uh, are underway in the US um, and um, uh, Asia and Europe with some preliminary data being um, shown, but not yet uh, peer reviewed or finalized or published. There are also, because it's an AAV9, it is a, um, a viral vector essentially that delivers this um, uh, SMN uh, gene. Um, we have to look to see if you have antibodies, right, to this virus. Um, and if you do, um, you wouldn't be able to um, uh, receive this uh, drug. 
there is um, another study underway currently um, looking at um, gene therapy, but being given intrathecally so that you can give a smaller dose. Um, and so then um, this is in um, individuals who are older. Um, there were um, three uh, doses that were tested and the third higher dose is currently on hold by the FDA um, because of um, some uh, changes seen in animal studies um, that need further clarification before moving forward with other um, enrolling other trials. So this is their um, clinical development um, program. Um, and as you see, they also um, have a <clears throat> study in pre-symptomatic um, children called SPRINT um, that's also under underway, as does Musina said. And the STRIVE studies are the pivotal phase three studies that I had mentioned. Um, and the START is the one that was published. STRONG is the one that's on hold. So, Evrisdi. <laughs> I'll wait till that starts to roll off my tongue. A RISD plan um, is a product uh, by Gentech, a subsidiary of Roche, um, in collaboration with uh, I think the SMA Foundation, um, that just recently got FDA approval um, with a label of um, uh, children being over two months of age with SMA. Um, it was also granted priority review uh, by Health Canada and filing application only this year um, and also getting a parallel expedited um, health technology assessment review. Um, so um, Canadian regulatory process doing its best. Um, there were um, two pivotal studies that have been completed, um, one being in um, non-ambulant children, adolescents and adults sunfish. Um, and this was a randomized trial with a placebo arm um, enrolling um, children um, and then adults up to the age of 25. Um, so in terms of generalizability, I would say that this is probably the clinical trial that had the most generalizability um, in enrolling um, really a representative sample um, of um, older individuals, um, individuals who've had a longer disease duration, who've had scoliosis and contractures, um, breathing difficulties, feeding difficulties, and so on. And the study did reach its primary um, outcome. Uh, there is also a confirmatory study in infants, um, and this was firefish. Um, so ever since Endear, or the study that had a sham procedure for new senior sin, um, infants with SMA, um, don't have a placebo arm anymore in their clinical trials. It's just deemed to be unethical. Um, so um, this is a confirmatory study looking at um, bigger effect sizes, such as survival um, or event-free survival um, as the main uh, point, um, and also um, some functional outcomes also meeting its outcome. There are other studies currently underway, um, one being um, rainbow fish in pre-symptomatic individuals and the other jewel fish um, for individuals who've previously received another um, treatment such as nucinersen or gene therapy who've now um, uh, moved on to um, uh, receive risk diplom, and this is more of a safety study to see how um, safe it is to combine this um, treatment. And it's a once oral uh, treatment that is given and this is just a snapshot of their clinical development uh, program. So firefish and sunfish, they mentioned, are complete and now um, an open label extension phase um, and uh, jewelfish and rainbow fish underway. So clinical trials, to know, uh, I hope you're all familiar with this website. I'm going to walk you through it because um, it's one that I'd love you all to um, access regularly to get information from. Uh, it's clinicaltrials.gov, um, and so you can Google it and access it. Um, and under condition, you type in SMA, um, and then you click enter. And um, you can even narrow it down to studies that are recruiting or, or um, active, not recruiting, not yet recruiting to get an idea. Um, so here I, you know, I clicked on the ones that are kind of still underway by saying not yet recruiting, recruiting, active not recruiting. Um, and then it gives you a list of the different studies. And then if you click on one of them, you actually can go on to see um, not just what the study um, inclusion exclusion criteria are or the broad strokes, um, but also where the study sites are um, so that you can directly find out um, if there is a study in Canada 
um, or if there is a study in the US um, that's um, near the Canadian border to, um, to access. So I will um, stop there and stop sharing um, to see if we have a few minutes for um, questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Oskui. As always, very clear and very informative. I'm gonna go ahead and share some questions that came in prior to today's session. Um, but what I'd like to do is also remind anyone if they have questions that they can use the chat box feature or the live Q&A feature to type in their uh, questions. One question that we received, um, Dr. Oskui, is it, is it common for an adult male with SMA3 to have calves which are not at all atrophied? My brother and I both have SMA3 and our calves are virtually unaffected. It's like the SMA stops at the kneecaps. Can you speak to this? Uh, so with the caveat that I am a pediatric neurologist, <laughs> um, but uh, spinal muscular atrophy in terms of the um, the distribution of the muscles affected, it's not um, uniform across the body. Um, and we do know that the proximal muscles, so your um, hip flexors, for example, or your shoulder girdle muscles will be affected more than your distal muscles. Um, and um, even within the um, uh, cranial nerves, your bulbar um, muscles uh, for are affected more than, for example, your eye muscles. Um, so there is an asymmet asymmetry in terms of the which muscles are affected and not. Um, and yes, definitely, um, you know, early in the disease um, uh, progression, distal muscles are relatively preserved. And I would say that type two and type three patients that I've come across um, will lose their um, knee reflex, um, showing that they're. Um, uh, quads um, are weaker first, um, long before they lose their ankle jerk, which is the, the, um, the tendon reflex from your calf muscle. Thank you. Another uh, question that came in is, my newborn daughter was diagnosed with SMA at birth via the Ontario Newborn Screening Program. What does the research say about receiving two treatments uh, for SMA? So will she have better outcomes with combined treatment? Um, so no one knows the answer to this question is how I'll start. Um, I think she has the best chances for outcomes thanks to the newborn screening program in Ontario. Um, Ontarians are the first to benefit from this um, and I really hope that soon um, this inequity um, will be addressed and that all Canadians can benefit from a newborn screening program because um, we know that um, if you think back on Dr. DeGuise's presentation, we want to um, boost or improve the SMN protein, right? And so if there is a treatment that effectively brings up your SMN protein level effectively and throughout your whole body, right? So those are two things. Um, the earlier you can do that, the better. And so comparing one treatment to the other, I would say, how much do we know about um, the distribution of, um, is it boosting the SMN protein everywhere or preferentially only in some places? Um, so we would want it to be everywhere because um, yes, motor neurons are more, more sensitive, but it's really essential throughout the body is, is, is my personal conviction. Um, and um, for how long will that treatment take place? So there are some treatments that are um, daily or every few months, um, and, and we know what their half-life is and they need to be continued. Um, some that are single, um, I think the jury's still out as to how long they'll um, be effective. Um, I know um, we know in the um, short term, being a few years, um, that it's still effective, um, but for how long? Um, and so if we had better ideas of, um, you know, how long these treatments are um, effective at, at boosting SMN protein, then at that point, maybe combining with another drug that would um, be able to maintain those SMN protein levels um, could be considered. Um, but because 
these questions haven't really been answered. Um, there are clinical trials currently kind of looking at this, first starting with safety. So um, there's rainbow fish, for example, um, and I did mention another study of, um, from Biogen um, looking at um, combining nucinersin as well. So I would say today, um, that's that's the that's the most I can I can enlighten you with, but the jury is um, still out, and I think not enough evidence today to combine treatment outside of a clinical trial. Excellent. Um, in line with uh, with your response, a uh, question that we received in the chat box is: Since timing of diagnosis is important, where are we with prenatal or newborn screening for SMA in Canada? Um, so uh, newborn screening um, in Ontario um, is well underway. Um, Alberta is um, hopefully soon going to come on board. Um, the rest of um, Canada, there is a lot of active discussion. Um, everyone has the everyone agrees that this is needed, um, but newborn screening programs are provincially regulated. Um, and so unfortunately, we have to kind of jump through um, a process within each province um, to do this. But I think adding in um, the patient community's voices to the importance of this will go a long, long way um, in making this a priority um, disease to add to the newborn screening programs. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Um, a question that I received is uh, from an adult with SMA. What can he do to slow down uh, their condition? I'm nervous that I'm declining rapidly, but I'm unsure if it's aging or SMA or both. Is there information about aging in SMA? Um, so as a pediatric neurologist, again, that's my uh, disclosure before answering this question. Um, we know from... Um, observational studies that um, individuals with spinal muscular atrophy continue to lose function over time. And um, some have this um, misconception that, um, you know, there's a stability. Um, and yes, you know, from today to tomorrow to six months to maybe even a year, um, there is stability, but if you um, use a, a, a longer lens, there can be a decline um, that is observed, right? Um, and this concept of the SMN protein um, being needed, kind of a steady state throughout life, um, comes into, into play here. Um, the treatments available to adults, um, unfortunately, it's quite inequitable across Canada. Um, but um, I think important to um, advocate for um, because on an individual basis, um, even if it's a um, small change over time, that small change can be quite meaningful to you. Um, so yeah, I, I hope it addressed the question, but uh, I can't specify um, aging specifically beyond that. Thank you so much. To end today's webinar, I would like to thank our speakers for sharing their insights for the time they took to provide clear information, especially being on call today. Thank you both so much. As always, I encourage you to go on our muscle.ca webinars page or email us at research at muscle.ca. We'd be happy to relay some of your questions if you think of any to our speakers. Um, we would also like to thank Roche and Biogen for helping to support educational initiatives like this and for the ongoing collaboration with MBC. I will post a uh, top five key learnings from today's webinar and also the link to the recording by the end of the week. As always, thank you so much for joining. We'll see you all next week. Thank you.